Today's show is on Me Too Issues in Therapy, Helping Men Wake Up and Women Speak Up. This podcast has been developed with the intent to inform and educate the general public and providers and should not be relied upon for any other purpose. The content, views, and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the speaker and not those of the San Diego Psychological Association. Welcome to the San Diego Psychological Association's podcast, Diving Into Healing. Welcome, Dr. Wexler, and thank you so much for being on our show. Thanks very much, Michelle. Looking forward to the conversation. So you have an extensive background in clinical psychology, and I was curious if you could share a little bit about your background with us and our listeners. Okay. Well, I have been a clinical psychologist here in San Diego uh, since 1983, so almost 38 years now. I've always had a general clinical practice like many clinical psychologists have. But my specialty area really over the year has been what I call relationships in conflict. And that has specifically meant dealing with issues with relationship domestic violence. And uh, I and the the team of people I've assembled over the years have developed a lot of different treatment programs for how to treat offenders of domestic violence, both male and female. And the, the, the different models and programs that we've used have been implemented all over the world. We think there's about 60,000 people who've now gone through our treatment programs, and we've trained thousands of different providers on how to do this. And so the focus of a lot of the, the books that I've written, in addition to the domestic violence stuff, has been on really helping relationships in conflict, and specifically uh, men dealing with basically teaching men how to do relationships better, whether that's men who are more I don't know, more, more everyday problems like communicating with their partner or having or getting too easily hurt in their relationships or things like that, all the way up to the more extreme cases like domestic violence. That has really been the primary focus, uh, specialty focus of my clinical career. And I've written seven different books and, as I said, designed a treatment programs and been on various mm-hmm. you know, TV and radio, all focused on the relationships and conflict issue. And what brings me to the topic we're doing today is a new book that uh, is about to be released with my co-author, Holly Sweet, in Boston called Me Too Informed Therapy. And it's really about the ways in which the Me Too world that has just sudden, you know, exploded in terms of our, our national consciousness the last few years, how that has shown up in terms of uh, people's uh, people's relationships or individuals doing reckoning of their own lives, either women who've been on the receiving end or men who've been on the the, the giving end, so to speak, of, of Me Too offenses, the ways in which that's really affected more everyday people. So that's the most recent focus of some of this general umbrella of relationships and conflict. That's wonderful. You know, it, it is such an important topic and so relevant today. And, you know, there's the, the history here of, you know, women development and, and women basically having discussions about, you know, equality and egalitarianism in the home and in relationships. And I think as we're speaking in this particular setting, we're specifically addressing heteronormative relationships, heterosexual relationships. And it is quite interesting because now we're seeing a paradigm shift where in the past, socially, it seems that it's been okay or acceptable for there to be certain types of behaviors within relationships and and things that were even as recent as the turn of the century here, where we were seeing, you know, women not have the ability to engage in certain activities or do certain things or, you know, basic rights. It's very fascinating. And uh, as we both know, in human development, behaviors is sometimes difficult to change. Mm -hmm. And especially it's been socialized. That's the understatement of the century. Right. (laughs) (laughs) But you're right. (laughs) Exactly. So I'm curious, you know, given your background, it makes sense to me how this is, has included, you know, the Me Too movement, how this can be included in, in what you have been working on and, and your specific research and application of treatment. Tell us something about how you became interested in the Me Too movement specifically and how that led you to write a new book on the topic. I guess I, like everybody else, was shocked by the intense focus on Me Too that just exploded really with, I mean, the, the key thing in terms of the media was with the Harvey Weinstein and, and, and the, all the revelations that were, came out about him. And that just opened up a, a floodgate. Of course, some of it really predated maybe a year earlier with the revelations about Donald Trump and some of the, his, to say the least, Me Too violations. 
I got swept up very much in trying to understand all these different reports that were coming out of the woodwork about the ways that men have, to extreme degrees or very modest degrees, behaved somehow inappropriately in their relationships with uh, women and that would fall under the Me Too umbrella and all the ways in which women have been affected in ways that I, I think, and we all always kind of knew about, but suddenly it was just so highlighted. You'd have to be you know, living on Mars to not pick up the, the, the shift in national consciousness about these issues. And these things don't come along all the time. These kind of immediate transformations of what people are talking about and not only at a national media level, the big headlines in the paper, but on an everyday level in people's homes. And I started hearing more and more about all these reports in my clinical practice. And that was really the stimulus. So I was hearing more of these stories and the ways in which the global Me Too stuff that was just that was showing up everywhere was seeping into the thoughts and memories and attitudes of some of the men that I saw some of the women that I saw, and, and especially some of the couples that I saw. And frankly, it made me, like plenty of other, if I do say so myself, fundamentally decent men, and I, I like to think of myself in that category, but it made me really reflect back like, hmm, I know I've never, I'm not Harvey Weinstein, but what things have I ever done that in some way now looking back have been inappropriate in some way or have put perhaps led some woman who I was – in my in my life or my world to feel uh, in some way uncomfortable that I didn't really realize or intend at the time. And what I found with not only with myself, but with, all, with a lot of the men that I saw, that they were really doing kind of a gut check. That's really been the stimulus for me. And, and I guess the one other piece is this general area has been something I've studied and worked with, you know, as I said, for decades about, well, relationship issues and the ways in which People do things, and frankly, particularly men do things to women that in some way are uh, have been hurtful or destructive. So all those things coming together has really been the stimulus for me. And you bring up wonderful points here, too, that there's, again, a socialization that has been kind of silently accepted. Mm-hmm. And we've seen this through the turn of centuries and centuries where um, there's been just kind of a, an unspoken uh, reality where, you know, these, there's been acceptable norms in specifically the dynamic between people who identify um, as male and for people who identify as female. And it's, it's now we're seeing this shift where there's an opportunity to learn to not feel shame or to internalize this for women, which is actually phenomenal. It's it's terrible that it's come on the heels of such marked news and things that have been very difficult. You know, one of the things that I find very disheartening is victim blaming. You know, there's a lot of shaming that comes, well, why didn't she speak up sooner? Not realizing that, you know, for women, there's so much shame when there's an assault or when right. there's violence or when there's even you know, something that it may not be considered an assault, but it is an offense. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these are things that we've been taught to keep quiet. And there's also the cultural considerations of this as well. You know, there's, there's backgrounds that is culturally acceptable to have, you know, these dynamics still be as they, you know, in a traditional sense as they've been. Right. Um, so it, it is interesting. It's a big shift. And while it can be exciting, you know, it can also have complications. I guess I, I'm curious, what have you learned about the controversies with addressing Me Too and, and kind of this paradigm shift in these issues? Well, it was interesting to see when this when first really hit the the news waves, which, and there's the, the early reports were the most, some of the most egregious offenders, you know, Harvey Weinstein, Larry Nasser, who was the USA gymnastics coach, Bill Cosby, uh, Roger Ailes at, uh, at at Fox News. I mean, th- these guys. When you hear their stories, these are like classic predators. I'm I'm reluctant to do any kind of formal psychiatric diagnosis from a distance, but I think I can safely say these guys got a lot of psychopathic traits, and so and and those are the most extreme cases. But uh, hearing those stories is really stimulated. Are all the ways in which the much more, I don't know, for lack of a better word, the more the more modest offenses. What what Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein did was not modest, but some of the other s- stories that have come out about Al Franken or Aziz Ansari or 
I don't know, somewhere in the middle, it would be somebody like Louis C.K. or or Charlie Rose or, you know, I mean, these are people who have clearly crossed some unacceptable line. But there really is a continuum. I mean, some of these offenses are significantly uh, represent a more significantly disturbed personality and have, you know, there's a different level of injury that takes place uh, for the victim. Now, it's hardly my job either as a as a person or certainly as a male to sort of judge how much injury a woman has suffered, whether it's a, a more mild offense or a more severe offense. But I just think it's common sense that there that we have to understand that there is a range of these sorts of things. And so part of what's fascinating to me, because so much of my focus professionally, not to mention personally, has been understanding male psychology and what triggers different men, I really wanted to look at what activates men mm-hmm. to do some of the things that they or we have done? And the answer is, it's complicated. There, there's a broad range. You know, there's, like I said, there's at the more extreme end, there's men who are just out for, you know, who are into power and domination and total gratification of themselves without regard for anybody. And we call those people, you know, having more psychopathic or extreme narcissistic traits. And there are a lot of other guys who are just kind of, huh, kind of clueless. They don't realize they weren't intending harm, but they still did harm. In the book that I've written and in in my clinical practice and just hearing stories from other people, there are a lot of stories like that of men who are seeking something, but they weren't necessarily seeking, they weren't not misogynistic. They're not trying to engage in some sort of severe power over women like Bill Cosby or somebody, but they still have done damage. There's one one case of a, a guy that I treated, and I talk about this in the book, about this guy who was Vietnamese American. He was come here as an adolescent. He was kind of a shy, introverted guy who really didn't get much about the ways in which, I don't know, how to deal with male female relationships in the United States of America culture you didn't get it and his version of being cute would be like you know showing porn pictures to his you know his female interns or something and he he would think oh this will really be a fun thing to do or they'll, they'll like me if I do this and he just had no real awareness of what he was doing and he was he was seeking some sort of connection or, you know, I call it searching for intimacy in all the wrong places. And for him, hey, to me, he's at the other end of the extreme with somebody like, you know, Bill Cosby or Larry Nasser, because he, as soon as he became aware that the women he was inflicting some of this on were offended or hurt or a little scared of him, he was horrified. He was beside himself that he would have done any kind of damage. And he was extremely open to getting educated about what behaviors of his were, what kind of effect those were having. And his capacity for empathy, a healthy capacity for empathy, really was a very valuable clinical tool. We realized that he was just looking for connection. He just was rather inept and clueless about how to get that. But I just bring up that example to say that there are, there is really a broad range here of what motivates the different men who one way or another have committed some sort of me too offense. And just one other thing I'll say on this subject is what's most interesting to me about examining all these issues is not the really dramatic and horrific cases, although they are pretty interesting, you know, with all the bizarre things that that some of the more extreme predators have done. What's more interesting to me is the way it is the more everyday cases. Nobody's getting criminal charges for people aren't necessarily, uh, they aren't having their lives ruined as a result of some guy's behavior, but it's still, it's affecting men and women in specifically in straight relationships, but also in gay relationships. And and there's can be somewhat similar dynamics, even though the fundamental 
paradigm we're studying happens to be male, female. Right. I'm glad you brought that up. And and I'm also curious, as you were describing that situation, um, that example, there could be a cultural component there, certainly. And, you know, there's various examples, I think, that I can think of just personally, where exactly that some, you know, a, a male friend or uh, an acquaintance may have said an off color joke or, you know, said something or done something or, there was a physical touch that wasn't welcomed, but you know it becomes a line that is very difficult to explain as a woman or as a person who identifies as a woman, right. and you know it becomes difficult for a man or a person who identifies as a man to say, "How do I then connect? How do I have you know this opportunity to connect with this person?" Because again, we're trying to write the rules and talk about it, and you know historically, as I mentioned before, you know women we've often and felt mm -hmm. like we couldn't say stuff. I've spoken to many, many of my colleagues and, and myself um, in my own practice, you know, just kind of sitting with people and, you know, kind of hearing the stories just like you. I, it really is, it's almost a paralyzing thing where if we do say something, we're ostracized, or if we don't say something, it wasn't said, you know, at that time frame where I was supposed to say it. So now it's not believed. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a really triggering situation. And I also want to bring up too, that women who have been victims of domestic violence and assault, there is definitely post-traumatic stress symptoms that linger. Absolutely. And, you know, it might not be the intention of a man to say or do or engage in a certain way, but it, it crosses a line to the extent that a, a woman can be triggered and how important it is for us to have these discussions as well. So I think it's good to and I guess I'll ask you this, you know, what do you see as the impact of the Me Too movement on women's ability to speak up? What you're focusing on here is to me one of the most striking things that I've noticed and that I find the most meaningful, frankly, in in my work with couples. I have seen a number of different couples where the advent of the Me Too movement, the coming out in a way of the of the Me Too experience, has really has triggered some women in couples about how certain behaviors that they're dealing with, the man in their life, are reminiscent in some way or activating of previous experiences that they didn't previously even consciously realize, that they weren't able to name it, and now they're able to name it. And I'll, I'll tell you a couple of examples that I think are really illustrate this. One of them actually is not from my private practice, as you'll see, but it's from Christine Blasey Ford who was the woman who accused Kevin Kavanaugh, the, the Supreme Court judge nominee at the time, of having sexually assaulted her when they were teenagers. And regardless of what one thinks about the veracity of her, if she identified him correctly or whatever, that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is that in interviews that she's had, this was in New York Times journalists, the way that this originally came out is because she and her husband, who she'd been married to for, I don't know, 20 years or something, I mean, like 2011 or 2012, they were having some marital conflicts. And one of the chief conflicts was this argument they were having about remodeling their house. Since so she wanted to have not only of the front door, which every house has, but a second front door with like an anteroom in between, because she said it made her feel safer. And he thought this was nuts. He thought that this doesn't really make sense. It's going to be extra expense. Architecturally, it, it's going to mess up the entranceway to the house. And he was getting really kind of annoyed and frustrated. It just didn't make any sense to him. And she just got adamant, like, this is what I want, and couldn't really explain it. They end up in marital therapy and discussing this. I don't know if she then realized it or certainly she then articulated it, that when she was 17, she had been sexually assaulted by this guy named Kevin. And ever since then, she's felt really unsafe and she's felt worried about being trapped in some place and feeling more vulnerable. And having that second door really, as a result of that experience that she's carried with her for, what is it, 30, 40 years or whatever old she is, this was important to her. And once she explained this to him, then he got it. Yeah, I'm not sure he got it in that, the first 10 seconds, but over the course of discussing it, it became clear to him that what seemed kind of irrational to him and just didn't make sense, given her background, it totally made sense. And then he was empathic 
She told him in more detail the story that she had never really told him before. She had mentioned it vaguely, but never really told it in detail. He was capable of being really understanding about that and could be much more flexible about this one particular issue about building the freaking door to their house. Now it made sense to him. I have seen example after example of those kinds of past experiences suddenly entering the room when couples are having these discussions or to a therapy office, you know, and sometimes in my room, when people are sitting there talking about these things, that response from the woman, sometimes showing up in terms of their sex life, suddenly, as she explains more of where that's coming from, it starts to make more sense to the guy. And it's able to bring out more of his empathic abilities. And that's why, for me, the one of the focus items here is helping men wake up and women speak up. And the more that women really feel like they can speak up, which has really accelerated since Me Too, it at least opens the door for a lot of men who are, except for the psychopaths or the men who don't care at all, but for a lot of the men that I see, it at least opens the door, gives them the opportunity of waking up and understanding more about how their particular behavior may be activating something that is reminiscent for their female partner of things from their past. And that's been really inspiring to me, frankly. I hate that there are so many Me Too stories, but I am grateful that those Me Too stories have become part of our national discussion and part of the local discussions, like in a couple, that has led to various relationship breakthroughs. I completely agree. You know, as you were speaking, really appreciative of the ability to focus on the everyday couple and not necessarily talking about the extremes here with the egregiousness of the examples that you've given. I read a recent statistic and I'm I'm not going to remember it correctly, but basically that if I'm remembering somewhat correctly, it was approximately that one out of three women can report some form of assault. And whether that is from the egregious to, you know, something uh, that we would consider a little bit more of an offense. And it's been reported that those statistics are actually probably highly undervalued, that we're not actually getting appropriate statistics because a lot of women are still not either recalling information, much like the example you gave um, with Dr. Ford. Uh, but, you know, it, it can be that, you know, we just the shame and the guilt and the internalization of the event stating something I constantly hear. Right. Um, and I'll share a little bit myself. I have also been victim to this. There is a shame and there is a feeling of, I don't want to tell anybody this is, this right. is my fault. I must have done something wrong when in reality that is not the case. And I think one of the things that you were mentioning earlier that, you know, being interested in how the Me Too movement is coming into relationships, you know, it's coming into everyday relationships and especially those that don't actually have any specific kind of offensive yeah. uh, situation where there hasn't been a direct boundary that's been crossed by the husband to the wife or the man to the woman, um, speaking in, in a heterosexual sense. It is interesting now how the Me Too movement you know, has now seeped in yeah. to everyday couples. And I'm curious, can you give some guidance for this and talk a little bit about that? To me, the, the mantra in terms of these issues in couples is, I don't know what order, but helping men wake up and women speak up. I think it's men's responsibility to be as, number one, as self-reflective or self-evaluative as possible. You know, I, there's one chapter in, in our book called, Did I Do That? Which is, uh, which is a story of men looking back and saying, ooh, I never thought of myself as a, you know, an offender or a Me Too violator or something. But I do remember this one time with, you know, where I know that something was, this girl was in trouble and I didn't do anything about it. I think I was I, I think I contributed to that. Ooh, I don't like thinking of myself that way. It requires men really doing that kind of gut check and being uh, and also being creating an atmosphere if they're in a straight relationship of being uh, that with their female partner that can really feel safe revealing information and feelings to them about 
what's what their experience is. And of course, for women in a straight relationship, I think the more that women can feel like they have room to speak up, the better. Uh, now, as you've alluded to before, that's a little easier said than done. And we need to be careful about uh, shaming women who don't speak up, whether it's don't speak up to the police or to a human HR department in their, their business uh, or just to their own partner. Because there are a lot of reasons why, uh, a, a very understandable reasons why a woman would not want to speak up, including fear, shame, questioning her own reality, not wanting to be seen as sort of oversensitive or, the, you know, r- ruining the party or, you know, doesn't know how to flirt or something like that. But the payoff, I think, when women do feel like they can bring some of those things up to their uh, and I'm, right now I'm just talking about to their own partner, not so, not so much to the authorities or whatever. The path in many reasonably healthy relationships is really worth it. To me, those are the key guidelines of really what we're looking for or what I would encourage couples to to aim for. And part of it, I think, is meant for men is being curious, we're saying, you know, with all this Me Too stuff. Tell me about times when you felt like you've been on the receiving end of some of these things. I, I really want to understand better. And partly because I love you and I care about you and I want to understand, but also because I want to make sure I don't do anything unintentionally that might somehow be reminiscent of that or, or reactivate that for you. I want to learn more about this. So I think those are the some of the key principles here. Oh, that's that's wonderful. I actually haven't heard that before. And it was interesting, my own momentary reaction when you said that I personally um, have not heard uh, currently of anyone delivering a message like that, that I think could be so wonderfully opening and comfortable um, and allow and grant women and or any victim who has been assaulted in any way to tell their story. Uh, So many times it's just up to the victim to speak. And that can be really horrible. And we've heard of examples where, you know, victims have spoken up and has reported things and it's been completely dismissed and, you know, gaslighting and, you know, these kind of examples, right? To hear the way you said it just now, boy, I I really, I I think that could just open up so many healing doors in a relationship, Um, just being curious about your partner. And I think this goes across culture, across, you know, sexuality. I think it goes across the board. I really like that. And, you know, I'm curious too, I want to bring in the culture a little bit. Speaking of people, you know, who are uh, multicultural, you know, I myself identify um, from a marginalized group. You know, it's difficult because there's traditions, there's norms that have not had this, you know, have not had the shift in in this Me Too movement. Um, Do you have any suggestions or recommendations on how to communicate? I I really love that, you know, kind of introduction. And I think that can be used, you know, for someone to be curious. Do you have any other recommendations that might be helpful for marginalized groups? Don't know of anything really specific to offer there. Because I think ultimately, the same strategies or the same approach to issues really applies whether we're talking about you know somebody from a more traditional culture or we're talking about a same-sex relationship or the, some of the principles are the same. I guess I would say that if I were a woman and I was uh, with a man who grew up in any kind of culture where they clearly had some more you know traditional gender role expectations, men in charge sort of thing. Uh, Or if I were advising this woman, I wouldn't advise her to do anything different from what we've been talking about, but just be prepared for the fact that the the message getting through might be a little bit more stubborn in terms of its, the difficulty in in getting through because you're dealing with somebody who's who's had uh, some uh, attitudes that have really been ingrained. If I can just sneak in one more story that I think is relevant to that, a couple from a, uh, both from a Middle Eastern culture. They both grew up with uh, some very traditional values with 
men, male entitlement and uh, different, very strict gender role expectations. And the um, early in their relationship, uh, I, when I saw this couple, they were in their early to mid thirties and they've been married a couple of years. They struggled a lot because he really had a lot of expectations about, you know, dinner on the table and sex when he wants it and some of the sort of classic male expectations. And she, having grown up in with some of those expectations about women's roles, she kind of reluctantly conformed to that because she wanted to be a good wife, but she kind of got tired of it. I mean, she was living in 21st century American culture and struggled with that. And there were they had a lot of conflicts about that, about that, about that and that's originally why they came in to see me. But they really worked a lot of a lot of that out. And to his credit, he really, really started to see how he was contributing to to a lot of their problems. Then they're having a discussion about the Me Too movement, and they're both politically very progressive. And he had a lot of. They were both totally in agreement about how horrible some of these stories were that were coming out, and some of the really disturbing behavior. And then he says this. He says, "You know." What Louis C.K. did was bad, but not anywhere near as bad as, uh, I think he said, Michael Jackson and R. Kelly, uh, you know, taking advantage of, of youths. And she just froze. And she said, so you think that if some guy masturbated in front of me, that that would be okay? I can't feel safe being in a relationship with somebody who has that attitude. And he's thinking, I, I, that's not, I wasn't saying that. You know, I'm all I'm saying is that some behaviors are really worse than others. Everybody can understand that part. And he tried to sort of defend that, and that did not do any good at all. What finally turned out to be the story, it's very similar to the uh, Dr. Ford situation. When she was in graduate school, she had had a dissertation chair who really, to coin a phrase, me too her. And she, she, he really, he was flirting with her and really, and he would, he would have her in a room and he would be sort of pressuring her for sex. And, you know, she was really, really felt trapped physically and emotionally or psychologically by him because she needed him. He was her dissertation chair and she didn't want to do anything to cross him, just like so many women have experienced in, in job situations. And it was really disturbing. It went on for months. She was. She managed to fend him off from doing anything overtly sexual with her, but she was always under pressure. One time, he zipped on his fly and wanted to expose himself, and she tried to turn away. But it, you know, she was terrorized by that, very understandably, and she felt like she had no one to talk to. She couldn't. Her family, she said, would freak out if she told her brother he would have gone and killed this guy. He didn't want to do that. She couldn't go to the authorities at, at her campus because she didn't want to jeopardize the relationship with with the professor. Classic story. So what she what finally came out as we figured this out in the therapy sessions is that as soon as he made this comment about Louis C.K., all she could think of was that her husband was somehow minimizing what had been done to her back then. And to his credit, when she then told the story in more detail, he dropped all of his attempts to sort of defend himself about what he had said. And really said, I feel so bad. And, and his parting line was, by the way, if I ever found out that Louis C.K. was masturbating in front of you, I'd kill him. And she actually laughed at that and said, I bet you would. With that she was able to make this connection, it opened up for them the capacity to really relate on the real issues that were happening. The real conflict wasn't about their opinions about Louis C.K. versus Michael Jackson. The real thing was that she was living with this trauma that she had never really revealed to him. And he, as a result, he couldn't understand some of her behaviors, very much like with the Christine Blasey Ford situation. And I'm bringing this up because it was a, a it had a cultural component uh, in there that part of what infiltrated their conflict was that the guy here was not exactly clean and or, or not totally innocent. He had never done anything, you know, forced any sex on her or anything like that. But he had some of these rigid attitudes about male expectations. And that had that played a role in, in some of the, the ways these conflicts emerged for the two of them. I got a lot of these stories about uh, about the, the ways in which this, this has come up, either an individual or 
among the couples that I see. Right. Wow. Thank you so much for elaborating on that. And, you know, I, I'm getting so many wonderful takeaways and I, I thought it might be good for us to kind of summarize a little bit here how to basically give bullet points on how men can serve as allies to women who have suffered in Me Too and maybe some recommendations that you might have for couples and specifically for women who want to communicate with their partners what they've been through. Could you give us a, a brief summary for our listeners? Sure. Um, well, <clears throat> going back to a couple of the things we've that have already come up in our dialogue here, it's really incumbent upon men not just to, well, number one, it's incumbent on upon men to not do anything nasty to women. Okay. I mean, that's the sort of, that's like bare minimum, you know, don't do anything that is, that could qualify as, as some sort of sexual pressure or sexual put downs or anything that, that would be like that, obviously. But not only that, to be, as I said before, to be curious and to make it clear that not only are you there if she wants to talk, but you really want to open that door. You really are interested in what her experiences have been and how that's that's shaped her sense of safety out in the workplace, how that's shaped her sexuality, how that's shaped her attitudes or trust levels about men, all those different things to be really open to that. And another another angle to this is that if you're a guy, and this is, doesn't just apply to somebody's uh, intimate partner, but if you're somebody's if you're a friend to a woman or somebody or, or this woman is your sister or, so, or your daughter and you hear about some experience that she's had, there is one very, very, very simple instruction. Listen to her story <clears throat> and, when she, and listen to, to her story and listen to what she tells you she needs from you. And that could range anything from I need you to go to bat for me and call the police or I need you to do nothing but listen to my story and don't get, uh, and don't get over involved. Don't get any more involved than uh, I want you to be. And very few men are likely to, to mess up if they just can stick to that instruction. So many men get activated by, you know, we, we men feel like we need to take action and protect women and do the, and be bold and problems, bold problem solvers, which, you know, comes in very handy, obviously, in many situations, but it doesn't come in handy when the person who we're trying to protect doesn't want us to do that. So those, those are my main bullet points that I can think of at this very moment. That is a wonderful summary, and I have learned a lot today. It's interesting hearing it from your perspective and what you've seen in your your research and application of treatment. Um, and you know, I, I it, it's giving me a lot to think about too. And and you're right; it's a very complicated conversation. And the bullet points in the summary that you just gave, I think, brings it down to a very simplistic level. And it, again, it was interesting as you were saying that. I was noticing how excited I was getting hearing it, you know, like to imagine having a conversation that could flow like that, where the curiosity came in and listening from a non-judgmental stance and, you know, to, to learn from this paradigm shift, to learn how to engage, um, you know, with women and, you know, and I can see this being applied to various relationships, you know, whether it's uh, familial, whether it's even in same sex relationships, you know, across culture, that we're learning how to be empathic, and we're learning how to understand another person's story from from their perspective. Um, it will take time. This, as we said earlier, it's it, it's definitely going to be behavior change. It's going to take time. Um, but I'm so grateful for you coming on today and giving us such wonderful information. Thank you so much, Dr. Wexler. We really appreciate you being here with us today. Do you have any final thoughts? Good. Thanks. I've, I, I don't, uh, I guess the one other thing that I could, I was thinking as you just did that summary is the, uh, uh, one more tip for men is the non-judgmental quality because it's, uh, and I mean, women or men actually really need this advice. When you hear the way that somebody, some quote unquote victim has dealt with their experience, 
be really careful about judging. You know, you, you do not know what it's like until you've been in that person's shoes. If that person froze or didn't report, or continued in a relationship even when there was some sort of abusive behavior taking place, it is really easy to to say, oh my God, how could you do that? Or why didn't you do this? Or 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 the, even the old fashioned lines of why did you go to his apartment in the first place? Or why did you dress like that? Or, you know, the less judgment, the better. And that, I mean, that's sort of a subcategory of the just listen, but that's an important one I really want to emphasize. Wonderful. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Wexler. We really appreciate you being on the show, and I look forward to having a further conversation with you in the near future. Okay. Thanks very much, Michelle. I enjoyed it. The information and advice offered is not intended to treat or diagnose and is not meant to replace any other professional consultation. If you'd like to know more about the San Diego Psychological Association, go to our website at sdpsych.org. That's S-D-P-S-Y-C-H dot org. Thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time, take care of yourself and be well.